As a young student at the University of Vienna, I attended lectures of outstanding biologists, most notably Rupert Riedel and the Nobel laureate Konrad Lorenz. At that time, their research centered mostly on the evolution of the human brain and the development of our consciousness. And they also talked about so-called extreme organs, which are organs with limitless and unchecked growth, and illustrated it with the example of the saber-toothed tiger. The teeth of the giant cat, by a whim of nature, one day started to grow. As this initially was an advantage in catching prey, the teeth grew and grew and grew until they became so long that they couldn't catch prey anymore, and they died out. Lawrence and Riedel came up with a rather interesting observation that in the history of life on Earth, this phenomenon of extreme organs is quite common. But all creatures that developed such an extreme organ have gone extinct in a relatively short period of time. And they argued that also we humans have an extreme organ. Our brain, which we are all so proud of. This, of course, prompted the question, are we also prone to become extinct in the near future? Well, fortunately, Riedel pointed out that there is a striking difference between the human brain and other extreme organs. While teeth, for instance, cannot reflect on themselves, the human brain can. We are able to reflect on its growth, and at least in theory, we could correct its fatal consequences before it is too late. But when we observe what we are currently doing, it appears that we completely dismiss this chance and pursue the opposite of what we should do. We invent and support almost exclusively practices that foster limitless growth, vastly accelerating our chances of extinction. The changes are so dramatic that scientists are already talking about the Anthropocene. If the universe had been created 24 hours ago, which is 86,400 seconds. We, as you can see, would have been here for only one single second. But during that tiny time period in the history of our planet, we have made bigger changes to the environment than any other species before. I have the feeling that humanity, like so many other species we are so concerned about, will very soon, and I mean very soon, join the ranks of the species threatened by extinction. After studying biology, physics, mathematics and medicine for quite a few years, I followed my calling for the arts and became a theater director and stage designer for most of my life. But then, the more I saw what we are doing to our planet, the more I started to ask myself, don't we as a species, like all other successful species that have been around for so long, don't we also have a role? Can it be true that our role is just using up resources and turning them into irreversible waste? This question became so urgent that I changed course and went back to studying, in particular ecology, permaculture and soil biology. And I read books. Books not only about science, but also about psychology, philosophy, arts, music books about anything that could get me closer to answering this question, what is our role? When I eventually came across the teachings of the well-known physicist and ecologist Fritjof Capra, things started to fall into place. From Capra, I learned that complex systems, such as ecosystems, in addition to being analyzed, need to be mapped. He taught me that one needs to look at the functions of elements and their relations to each other, rather than their physical properties. This showed that conservation can't be confined to its area, but needs to be embedded into the larger system. The following presentation will be about reintegrating ourselves into the natural ecosystem. It will consist of three parts. First, the Refugio Tinti, a systemic approach to conservation. Second, reaching beyond our borders, a proposal of a profitable alternative to monocultures. 
and lastly, engaging with the local community as part of the larger system. So, when I came to Costa Rica about five years ago, I was looking for an abused piece of land with the goal to restore it by introducing and connecting all elements necessary to recreate that resilient system we call ecosystem. I found this land in the southwest of the country. It was a swampy pasture, toxic from decades of industrial rice cultivation, and when no rice would grow anymore, cattle herds compacted the depleted soil. Erosion was rampant and the soil was virtually empty of organic matter, minerals and nutrients. And how we have got from this to that, in only three and a half years, I will show you now. We will go on a virtual tour featuring the following elements. Earthworks, ecological architecture, soil restoration, learning from the efficiency of nature, reforestation and food forest, food cultivations, and our animals. So please, follow me now through our project. There's always the possibility to let degraded land recover by itself. But as we probably have already missed the chance of just protecting natural habitats, we must begin now to actively restore them. In addition, as I have mentioned before, we wanted to find our place, our function in the web of life. And to find this point of reference, we asked, how is the land better off with us than without us? Better being defined as more biodiverse, more productive, more resilient, and above all, still self-regenerating. The refugio is located within a so-called biological corridor. Biological corridors are forested pathways through which animals can pass from one protected area, like a national park, to the other, which significantly expands the habitats of animals living on either side of the corridor. The other motive for those corridors is to avoid inbreeding and preserve genetic diversity. The government of Costa Rica initiated many of such corridors. One of them is Amistosa, the corridor connecting the national parks Corcovado and Piedras Blancas, with La Amistad, the national park that reaches from Costa Rica to Panama. We are located within that corridor, and therefore our goal is to contribute to its reforestation, while creating a habitat for a maximum of biodiversity, and also growing enough food for ourselves to become self-sufficient. To keep the water in the wetland and maximize its usage, we dug a series of shallow and irregular wildlife ponds and piled up the excavated earth in between those ponds. This resulted in soil just high and dry enough to plant a variety of swamp trees. We mixed forest trees with edible trees such as cacao, jackfruit, papaya, cashew nut, water apple and so on, and also ficus, wild cashew and many other forest trees. On the other hand, the wildlife ponds created habitats for animals that haven't been here before, such as the rare boat-billed heron, successfully breeding here already for the third season. Another rare bird here is the green ibis, which actually belongs to the Atlantic side of the country and hasn't been seen on the Pacific side for decades. Jacanas, purple gallinals, six species of herons, whistling ducks and many other water birds became residents in our wetland ever since. So far, over 200 bird species have been counted in the refugio and its surroundings, and the number is rising. Mammals, insects, amphibians, we are still counting, 
and among the reptiles there are also caimans and alligators. About one third of the land we left largely untouched to observe and study what nature does by herself. However, we deliberately planted two small corridors across that part of the wetland in order to connect our patch of forest and the growing food forest with a national park. As you can see, everything recovers somehow. But what we can do is to speed up that process. So-called weeds, like many may call this vegetation, are band-aids that nature applies on her wounds caused by floods, droughts, landslides, etc. and also, of course, by human disturbances. Interesting enough, most weeds are also medicines for humans. But what they do, above all, is assimilating minerals from the depths of the soil and thereby making them available for the next generation of plants. Now, when we try to speed up the process of regeneration, we never start with uprooting, but chopping and dropping the weeds. By doing so, the weeds grow faster and faster, and with every chop draw ever more minerals to the surface, which are then incorporated into the topsoil and continuously enriching the soil. Several decades ago, Gmelina arborea, or white teak, an invasive tree from Asia, was introduced to Costa Rica with disastrous consequences. Its roots secrete chemicals that are toxic for native trees. Moreover, their fruits cause stomach ailments, with sometimes fatal consequences for toucans and macaws. Therefore, we cut down these trees, reforested the area with native trees, and recycled the wood into our buildings. The concept for the buildings was to rely as much as possible on materials that, if abandoned, nature could take back within a few years. However, as this land is largely a swamp, we couldn't entirely avoid cement, but limited it to the absolute necessary, which are the posts for the foundation. The so-called Casa Grande is a communal building consisting of four octagons, containing kitchen, dining, office, library and living area. No doors, no windows, everything is open, and respecting animals and all of nature, including ourselves, we completely abstain from electric lights. Getting up before sunrise and retreating after sunset very soon turned out to be a bliss rather than a sacrifice, and we are thanked by the many birds and animals that now are all around us. When we arrived here four years ago, soil samples showed that our soil was virtually empty of organic matter, nutrients and minerals, most notably phosphorus. Phosphorus is a mineral that every living cell needs in rather large quantities. Contrary to other essential minerals, like carbon or nitrogen, that exist abundantly in the air, phosphorus is added to the soil mostly just by weathering. So among the main minerals, phosphorus is often the first limiting mineral. People told us to use chemical phosphorus fertilizer in our first years, and it was predicted that it may take at least seven years to restore the soil to the necessary levels. About 70% of the world's phosphate reserves are found in the Western Sahara, where I traveled when I was young and saw one of these mines. Without going into further detail, I just want to say I didn't like what I saw, and therefore I was searching for a more socially and environmentally responsible way to get phosphorus into our soil. After some research, I found the Mexican sunflower, Titonia diversifolia. This local plant fascinates me, because unlike other plants, which are usually just not able to extract phosphorus from the rocks, 
It lives in symbiosis with a fungus that mines phosphorus from the depth of the soil in a mind-boggling process. The fungus grows his filaments, often many meters long, by growing a digging cell that transforms then into a body cell, which in turn grows a new digging cell, and so on. And when this digging cell hits a phosphorus molecule on a stone or a rock, and all rocks are full of phosphorus, it kind of explodes and chips out that piece of phosphorus. This phosphorus particle travels then in a way that yet remains to be understood, to the roots of the titonia, and the titonia pays with a piece of sugar, which the fungus needs to grow. All these titonias, the stems, the leaves, the flowers, are all full of phosphorus, and when we chop and drop them, over time they return phosphorus to the topsoil, available for even the most delicate plants. The next crucial step in soil restoration was microorganisms. The soil microorganisms, simply put, are the cooks for the plants. They transform organic material into plant-available food. We cultivate microorganisms with hot compost, multiply them with compost tea, and provide them with shelter through biochar. Let's start with the compost. Hot compost is a method of composting that breeds so-called thermophilic microorganisms. These microorganisms produce heat when multiplying and they thrive in that heat. To stimulate their growth, one needs to pile up the compost in alternate layers of carbon and nitrogen. Carbon is more or less any dry vegetation and woody material, and nitrogen is any kind of dung, green vegetation, and kitchen scraps. If the ratio is right and it's sufficiently wet, the pile heats up. After reaching a temperature of more than 130 degrees Fahrenheit, or 55 degrees Celsius, most pathogens and all weed seeds start to die off. The problem of normal, cold compost is that one throws everything on one pile and even though it's composting too, it takes a lot longer and may introduce all sorts of diseases and weed seeds into your garden or reforestation. Since microorganisms use up a lot of water and oxygen in this process, the compost pile needs to be turned for aeration and water must be added if necessary. The correct amount of water is, when squeezing a handful of compost, a few drops should appear. After the compost doesn't heat up anymore, which is usually after five turns, the thermophilic microorganisms have done their job. This process takes less than a month, but then it must cool down for another couple of months. In the next step, we multiply the microorganisms with a method called compost tea. The microorganisms need water, air, and food. So this container is filled with non-chlorinated water, preferably rainwater. At the bottom is an aerator to supply oxygen, and we add a couple of liters of molasses for food. Then we form a little sack from a mosquito net, like a tea bag, fill it with a few handfuls of ready compost, and lower that bag into the water. Under these conditions, the microorganisms multiply so rapidly that after 12 to 36 hours, the liquid can be diluted 1 to 10 and be used for several purposes. Sprayed on leaves, it serves not only as a fertilizer, but also as a protection from pathogens. In the presence of oxygen, these microorganisms are stronger than the pathogens and simply kick them off the leaves. We apply them regularly, and despite the high temperature and high humidity in our area, our problems with fungi are neglectable. And in addition, irrigating with compost tea provides the soil with large amounts of microorganisms, speeding up the process of transforming organic material into plant-available nutrients. To give microorganisms shelter and protect them from their predators, mainly amoebas, we use biochar. 
Biochar is a kind of charcoal filled with microorganisms. And mixed into the soil, it raises soil fertility significantly. The biochar kiln consists of three concentric sections. The outer section is for isolation. The inner section provides the heat and the middle section, hermetically sealed, contains the wood we want to turn into biochar. The middle section is now packed with dry woody material. This middle chamber with the wood has to be hermetically sealed from air, otherwise the wood turns into ashes. We start the fire here with a few pieces of wood. As the wood heats up, it gives off wood gases. These gases can only escape here, cool down, and as they are combustible, they are sucked into the middle chamber and take over the fire. It burns without smoke, and when the fire dies down, we can expect that about 80 to 90 percent of the wood has turned to charcoal. These pieces of biochar are pulverized here. And then we mix them under the cooling compost. After six weeks, the biochar is fully charged with microorganisms and can be used for planting. This charcoal under the electron microscope shows innumerable little tunnels and holes where microorganisms can retreat from predators and attach themselves to the huge surface. Our final essential step in soil restoration is our worm compost. These are the boxes where we breed our earthworms. Earthworms are the last consumers in a compost. They eat almost anything that comes their way. They love half-finished compost, coffee grounds, and even paper and cardboard. And what's particularly valuable is that the metabolism makes previously unavailable calcium digestible for plants. In nature, waste doesn't exist. It's a human invention. And in order to operate without waste, nature works in cycles. Some of nature's most important large cycles are the water, carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus cycles. All these cycles are of utmost importance and yet we humans mindlessly interrupt them all. Let's have a look at only two of them. The water cycle, for instance. Only 3% of all water on the planet is fresh water, and from that only 1% is available to us. New water is not created, it's a finite resource. And yet we continue to pollute this finite resource on a daily basis through agrochemicals, household chemicals, oil, sewage, plastic and many other things while almost a third of humanity has no access to safe drinking water. Moreover, we waste water through runoff from abused soils, deforestation, and last but not least, water toilets. In the Refugio, we counteract this by increasing water holding capacity through reforestation, ground covers, organic material, and biochar. And we save and protect it with composting toilets, biodegradable detergents and purifying water plants, ensuring that the water we use leaves the property even cleaner than it entered. Or have a look at the nitrogen cycle. With the help of microorganisms, atmospheric nitrogen is fixated in the soil. Through other microorganisms and a series of biochemical reactions, it moves through the soil, nourishing all of its inhabitants. And then it is returned to the atmosphere by microorganisms again, ready to continue its cycle. So obviously microorganisms play a huge role, but we are also messing with this process. Industrial agriculture, with its chemical fertilizers and pesticides, reduces soil microorganisms to a bare minimum interrupting this natural cycle and setting off a vicious cycle resulting in dead, compacted and eroding soil with minimal water holding capacity. 
Here in the refugio, in order to support rather than interrupt this natural cycle, we feed the soil with microorganisms through compost, large amounts of compost tea and biochar. All of this we produce on site. Regenerative cycles can be found everywhere in nature, from the large cycles we have just mentioned down to the cellular level and everywhere in between. Embracing this importance, as you can see here, we try to bind every element introduced into the refugio to a regenerative cycle. Bill Mollison, the founder of permaculture, once said, whatever we don't use sooner or later becomes waste. For this reason, we are constantly on the lookout for materials, energy sources, and even situations that are underused or not used at all. One such thing was the waste heat from the biochar production. To take advantage of this waste heat for cooking beans, rice, and other foods with long cooking times, we constructed this little item. Another formerly unused material was the vapor that escapes from this opening when the wood starts to heat up. We built this pipe in which the vapor rises and cools down and then runs back as a liquid, yielding a dark substance from which wood vinegar settles. Wood vinegar in different dilutions can be used as medicine, fertilizer, soil amendment, and in higher concentrations as biodegradable fungicide. In Costa Rica, more than 95% of electricity comes from renewable sources. So there was no need to install any solar panels in our refugio. But still, what can be used should be used. And so we built this solar dryer to harness the sun's energy. On the inside of this ramp is a black felt to trap even more heat, where the hot air rises and depending on the sun, heats up this chamber to over 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 48 degrees Celsius. And here on these shelves, we are drying our herbs, banana chips, yucca, chili, and many other foods. The primary objective of our reforestation is to contribute to the vital biological corridor Amistosa. This area, for example, connects our patch of secondary forest with a large wildlife refuge, Golfito. As already mentioned, our reforestation consists of a mix of edible trees with forest trees, largely mimicking a naturally grown forest, but also supporting our need for self-sufficiency. In addition to several kinds of bananas and plantains, we planted citrus, rambutan, star fruit, water apple, cashew, avocado, and about 20 more edible trees, interspersed with a large variety of forest trees suitable for this swampy area. We talked already about the importance of the titonia, the Mexican sunflower, drawing phosphorus to the topsoil. So as you can see, we surrounded every planted tree with a number of titonias to feed the reforestation. This, together with all our other strategies for soil restoration, led to a failure rate of less than 3% in our reforestation. To create garden beds in the swamp, which are high and dry enough to grow vegetables, we excavated deep drains and piled up the earth in between them. We filled these drains then with large river stones and packed them in a net-like material to minimize erosion. As the third function, in permaculture every element must have at least two functions, we topped the drains with gravel, resulting in these paths. We are growing many herbs and vegetables now, such as basil, oregano, lemongrass, 
curcuma, ginger, and many others. Katuk, several kinds of spinach, okra, taro, beans, and tomatoes are a few of the vegetables growing here. And this here is Sacha Inchi, a Peruvian nut, whose oil is so rich in antioxidants and omega-3, 6, and 9, that it's one of the most valuable edible oils on the planet. Because of its low smoke point, we use it only in salad dressings and other raw foods. And this local plant can replace garlic, which doesn't grow here in the tropics. Even though it's not at all related to garlic, its leaves have a strikingly similar taste. To fertilize vegetables, we planted in each bed at least one Mexican sunflower. Every full moon, we chop and drop them, replenishing the soil with a steady supply of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. <coughs> These are our chickens. Chickens are an important element in creating and maintaining our refugio as a self-sustaining system. So firstly, to be true to our principle of having a positive role in it, we need to be for the chickens as important as they are to us. So what is our role? We need to provide for their needs, which is a safe place, food and water. And all of this must come from the refugio itself. The jungle is a dangerous environment. Wild cats of all sizes, prey birds and snakes, all are their predators. So to provide for their safety, we built them a snake-proof enclosure where they sleep and breathe. This area around it is their scratch territory protected by normal chicken wire to keep the larger predators out. The next need we must provide for is food. It comes from two different sources. Kitchen scraps. And then we open this little door to venture out into the food forest, where they can supplement their diet with fallen fruits and a variety of seeds, worms and insects. They know the danger, so they usually never go too far, but occasionally it happens that they fall prey to an eagle or a big cat. And last but not least, they always must be provided with fresh water. It's not that chickens would die from dirty water, but they simply don't drink it and then suffer from dehydration. As of their functions, Chickens, as all other elements in the system, must be multifunctional. The first function, obviously, is they provide us with food. Most of their eggs end up in our kitchen, but when a hen wants to breed, we let her fulfill her natural behavior and make up for the loss in the jungle. Another important function is yielding a dung that is higher in phosphorus and nitrogen than all other dungs. And they are an important factor in pest control in the food forest. Our other joy in terms of domesticated animals is our pair of African water buffaloes, Mario and Leonie. As you can tell, they are awe-inspiring and respect-demanding animals. If one spends time with them, though, they become very tame and gentle. But why do we actually have them? In permaculture, every element needs to have more than one function, and the buffaloes are no exception. In the first place, they are certainly our beloved pets. But on a more practical level, they are opening up areas that have been choked by dense stands of invasive reeds where very few animals could live or even pass. In addition, their habit of creating mud puddles adds further to mini habitats for frogs, dragonflies and many other small animals. Even though monocultures are unsustainable interruptions in the ecosystem, they are a growing feature in our environment. 
eco-services like natural pest control, water holding capacity, renewable soil fertility and many others are missing in monocultures and have to be carried out costly by humans instead. To fight ecological degradation and point out an alternative, we calculated a blueprint for diversifying monocultures into profitable and sustainable polycultures. We would like to show you now a five-minute video animation about our concept of how to diversify palm oil monocultures. This is a classic oil palm monoculture. We will start on only one hectare, represented by the red line. As usual, 144 palms grow on one hectare. The first step is to remove around 90% of the palm trees to make room for cacao, bananas and the Inca nut, as well as plants which will continuously restore the soil. After this, we will prepare the paths between the crops. Some are 2 meters wide, others only 1 meter. Next, we plant dense rows of Mexican sunflowers to restore the soil one plant every meter and a half. The Mexican sunflower not only fixes nitrogen from the air, but also extracts phosphorus from the depth of the soil. The Mexican sunflower grows quickly and every two months after full moon, we cut it down to a height of about half a meter and let the organic material decompose to restore the soil and prepare for the Inca nut. Between the rows of Mexican sunflowers and the paths, we plant so-called support trees on both sides of the paths. Like the Mexican sunflowers, these support trees also fix nitrogen. We plant one support tree every 2.5 meters. The different colors represent five different species of trees. Their names are listed below. By pruning them every two to three months and letting the clippings decompose, they restore the soil, fertilize our crops and guarantee that the soil improves from year to year. The Inca nut is a vine, so the nitrogen fixing trees serve as supporters for the Inca nut to climb, hence the name support trees. For this to work, we need to put ropes between each one of them. An upper row is mounted as high as possible above the ground, so one is just able to reach it, let's say 210 centimeters and the lower row is fixed 40 centimeters below that. In order not to interfere with the roots of the support trees, the Inca nut has to be planted between them. So a third row that we stretch vertically between the support trees is necessary for the Inca nut to climb. After the ropes are mounted and the Inca nut is planted, our next crop are bananas. We are going to plant 310 plants and in order to plant that many, we need to organize them in circles. This form of cultivation is called banana circle in permaculture. Every 8 meters we dig a hole of about 1 meter in diameter and half a meter deep. On the mound around the hole we plant 5 banana plants. When the bananas are harvested, we cut down the stem down to a height of about one meter. This stem, with all its leaves, is chopped and thrown into the hole in the middle. This way, all the nutrients are concentrated in the center to fertilize the next bananas. That's why we can plant so many bananas in such a small space. And finally, our last crop is cacao. It will be planted between the banana circles. In total, we therefore have 62 cacao trees, 310 bananas, 384 Inca nut plants and 12 palm trees. And to restore the soil and fertilize the crops, we plant an additional 420 support trees and 708 Mexican sunflowers. This makes a total of 1896 plants from 10 species in only one hectare. Once established, this system continuously improves the soil and fertilizes itself regularly by pruning the Mexican sunflowers and the support trees. As you can see, 
This polyculture yields a revenue that is 20% higher than the former monoculture. This concept can be adapted to many different kinds of circumstances and crops. Cacao could be replaced by avocados, cashew nuts, or any other crop suitable for specific types of soil. Recognizing education as a leverage point, we are planning to implement a permaculture education and consulting center in the school of our village. The permacultural concept for the village aims to promote self-sufficiency and reintegrate the school into the ecosystem. Through playful participation, the children will not only learn about permacultural methods and the importance of zero waste and recycling, but also about the interdependence and functions of the different elements and the importance of natural environments for a sustainable system. In addition, this project will include permacultural workshops and vocational training relevant to the community. This in turn will lead to a rise in living standard and cohesion of the community. Now, let's put it all together. All elements have the important place to maintain the web of life, and we are no exception. We have asked in the beginning, what is our role? And we have stated that we want to assess whether this place is better off with us than without us. Better being measured by adding to biodiversity, resilience and productivity. And we have seen that the path to achieve this can be summed up in recognizing and embracing the cyclic nature of life on Earth. However, we are well aware that there are still some significant loose ends. We still have a car, laptops, phone and appliances, whose production, disposal and, in case of the car, also maintenance, are deeply unsustainable. But these are systemic problems that have to be solved on a larger scale, like transport systems, communication systems, and recyclability of all materials. We perceive progress not as recklessly inventing things that are inconsiderate towards nature's finite resources, but rather by inventing and developing methods and things within the framework of nature's regenerative cycles. Mm -hmm.